All right, welcome, folks. Oh, I have to share my screen, but I will do that in a moment. And welcome to our uh, eight-week feature writing program. This is the sort of week zero overview class where we are going to talk about just some of the basics of the course. You can click the video presentation if you want to follow along. And if you're watching on YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, or some other place like that, we recommend you come join us on Discord. Um, our Discord community is here to help you take your idea all the way from concept to finished draft in eight weeks. And we have programs for TV writing, novel writing, and features with more classes being added all the time. So uh, you're in a stage channel right now, meaning that you will have to be invited up to speak. Normally we cannot hear your mics, but if you'd like to speak out loud, you'll have to click the raise hand icon. It looks like this. You can find it at the bottom of your Discord panel. If you are requested to come up on stage, then you have to click that accept button. So look out for that kind of green bar with the button that has accept or decline on it. And if you're on a tablet or mobile device, you may have to turn to the side to find that. Okay, um, so Script Camp, we're a screenwriting community that takes you from idea to first draft to more polished script with lots of free classes, table reads, script swaps, and writers groups. We are geared towards putting you on the path to being a professional screenwriter, the long path. It's not an easy journey. Uh, it is, uh, you know, especially right now with what's going on, obviously. It's complicated and everything, and it's, you know, it's a long uphill climb. Uh, it takes many years to get good at this craft, so we don't promise quick solutions or quick sales. Or it's, it's not a get-rich-quick industry, but this is, you know, we're, we're trying to build those skills and, and kind of acquire the tools that you will need to do this professionally, both in terms of the writing itself and also everything surrounding the writing, such as that this what these programs are really good at that you can't necessarily do just writing by yourself is practice giving and receiving feedback and notes and things like this, which are an essential part of what we do. Screenwriters are, especially in the current sort of landscape, we are kind of mechanics that are brought in to assemble stories and to fix stories and put them together and to pitch on IP and things like that. So we have to be able to do more than just sit alone in your house and write something in your, you know, in isolation. You have to be able to collaborate well and work with producers and development executives and kind of find ways to navigate those relationships and to write the best version of what you're trying to create while incorporating aspects of other people's vision that you need to just be able to bake into the final pie of what you're doing. So um, I would try to get used to that idea that this is a very social, very collaborative job and form of writing. And we're trying to, of course, work on craft, a craft being an essential part of how you actually get in the door. So you have to be not only really good at writing the scripts, but also everything that has to do with just interacting with people and working with others to create like the best possible version of that story. So um, later today, we, I, if I'm feeling up to it, I think I will be probably feeling up to it, um, but this is at 5 p.m. We have a mini class on magic in fiction, so magic systems in fantasy, and it might also apply to things like horror and sci-fi has some t some speculative technology follows similar rules, so you might want to come by that if you're interested in those genres of those topics at 5 o'clock. Thursday, May 4th, we are doing a revision revising class called How to Fix Your Scripts. May 7th, we have week one of this class, so one week from today. Um, we will be continuing in this time slot, so Sunday mornings for feature writing. Sci-fi class, May 7th at 1 p.m. Copyright class, May 7th later that day at 5 Dialogue class, Thursday, May 11th at 6, and a scene workshop, May 14th, and a class on monsters and villains, May 14th later at 5 p.m. So those are all free and public classes you should come check out, but you should also definitely subscribe to Script Camp. Um, we, if by signing up for Script Camp, you get access to everything in the Skill Camp kind of server family. So any class or workshop or event on any of our servers, including Film Camp, Creator Camp, Word Camp, Toon Camp, which is for animation. Word Camp would be our second biggest server with, I think, about 300 members at this point. So only about a tenth the size of Script Camp, our biggest one at more than 3,000 members. But we still have classes on there and events, novel groups that or novelist groups that meet up once a week, genre groups, and novel boot camp that runs Saturdays from 12 to 2. So um, I'm not going to go into way too much about me. I've been a repped and working screenwriter since 2017 when I first got signed. You can browse that later if you want. Um, so today uh, we will be doing sort of a, a truncated, just the just the heart, just the points of interest, just the bullet points of the presentation on the eight week process, and then we'll go right into refining log lines. So remember to be typing up your log line and be ready to copy and paste that into our chat when we share those. If you want to get that early feedback, and if you want to, you don't have to share it now. If you share it now, I'll I'll lose it. But so try not, don't post them yet, but be ready to. 
And um, of course, you can also use the text channel on the left hand side of your Discord screen. If you click that small white word bubble over the classroom voice channel, it will open that up and you can use that for questions and comments as we move forward. When we get to actually reviewing your logline and giving feedback, I'll need to talk to you to ask questions, to kind of assess what your goals are for that project and make sure you're meeting those and to maybe just fix logic issues or, or things like that. So be prepared to speak out loud and also just if you want to go into screenwriting, you should be getting used to really doing a lot of this talking out stories and early versions of ideas and incorporating feedback and being kind of open to those things. So try to try to get good at that. Okay, um, so uh, you can sign up to join the bootcamp if you want to be in this course past week one. You're going to have to sign up for membership at scriptcamp.net slash membership. That's where you can sign up for your free trial um, for two weeks. Access to absolutely everything we do. Unlimited subscription uh, includes over 100 hours of events every month and huge discounts on things like consultations, proofreads, and coverage. You can get 40% additionally off if you are subscribing yearly instead of monthly. Okay, um, let's move ahead to uh, the ground rules. Um, so suggestions and guidance from me based on, or you know, to help you choose what to write for this bootcamp or for a program like this. This is a really abbreviated and kind of strict time frame to do something as big as, especially if you're new at this, writing a full feature script. It's like creating an hour and a half worth of high quality entertainment in theory, at least, uh, is not the easiest thing, not the simplest thing. This takes a lot of practice, and um, eight weeks just doesn't give you a lot of time for things like research or for getting every single fact right. So I, I say don't write a true story. Don't do something that you feel the need to get exactly right to do justice or to do honor to some real person or some you know group of people that you feel need this story. Don't write an import. Don't try to write an important story in the eight weeks of the class. I guess. Um, you can write, you can, of course, try your best and make it as good as you possibly can, but look at these as practice. Don't think that you're going to write um, something that's going to make your career overnight. If you're brand new at this, you know, someone's first painting is not going to get hung in a museum. The bar and the standards are really, really, really high for this, and it's a very kind of unintuitive sort of writing in a lot of ways. Most people don't grow up reading screenplays the same way they do with books or things like that. So, like, this just takes, it's like learning a new language in a lot of ways, or learning an instrument. And it, if it were an instrument, it would be the violin because it takes a while to just be able to produce a sort of clear, consistent tone that doesn't sound like, you know, a dying cat. Like when you're a kid, you just you try violin in the first like eight weeks or whatever. It sounds miserable, right? Well, screenwriting similar. It's not like you can just make it sound like music very easily if you don't know exactly what to do. So um, get used to that and try to move beyond the idea that any script needs to be a masterpiece. These scripts are, are like our ideas are should kind of be a dime a dozen in a way. It's not that we can't care about them. It's just that um, you, if, if you're trying to work towards being a professional, you have to get used to the process and you have to learn to organize. And you have to learn these strategies to, f towards working through a script and you know, outlining and planning and then executing that within a reasonable amount of time, which is you know, 8 to 12 weeks for a first draft is pretty standard for the industry. So that's why we sort of have set the boot camp at that length. Um, and uh, just try your best. If you fall behind, it's okay. There's no grades. There's no, you're not going to get slapped with a ruler if you... <laughs> until we have the technology for me to slap you with a ruler through the screen, um, then you will be just um, on your you're accountable only to yourself, and you will be just trying to keep up with the milestones, but if you fall a little behind, you can always join the next session um, if you need to. Furthermore, if you are going to continue in the class past the first week, so you don't have to do this today, but if you want to stay and continue in the course, you should use your real name. I mean, we can't use screen names in the industry. Or at least use something like a nickname. If you really don't want to use your real name, you can right-click your username to change it, or we can do it for you. OK, so try to just pick a brand new idea. Don't bring a rewrite, generally. I mean, you can bring a rewrite. It will just be much harder for you. And I reckon, because like this course, is the instruction is tuned not towards revision and working with notes and things like that, but towards writing something brand new. So if you have, if you have a choice, pick something new. Maybe some fun, crazy idea that you feel would just keep you excited and, and allow you to keep you know, keep your momentum up for the eight weeks that you'll be working on it. Um, so avoid true stories, anthologies, or adaptations of any kind. Um, don't do time travel, believe me. Just don't. 
every and every time somebody takes this as a challenge, they're like, oh, but I'm going to do time travel. And they always regret it. We've never seen someone even finish a time travel script in the class. And you just don't want the majority of the notes that you get to be on things like paradoxes and the basic logic of what's going on rather than the stuff that we really need to focus on. So it just makes your feedback much harder to give if there's a really complex system of rules in place in your story that is tough to keep consistent. It's really difficult to keep consistent through revisions. So just don't do time travel. Probably don't do a historical unless you have some background in that knowledge or you, I don't know, all you read is Napoleonic books. So you have a really good sense of the Napoleonic era or something like that. You can, you know, that might help, but it's again, just going to require more research typically to do historicals. So it's more difficult to do in eight weeks and beware of things that just make, uh, that just make your life hard on the page, clones, parallel universes, anything where there's multiple copies of the same people, Mo scripts that have tons of flashbacks or a flashback structure that is contingent on its uh, multiple timelines or things like that um, be really careful with those because those are again really difficult to keep straight especially if you're newer at this and especially if you're writing the script in eight weeks but just take a big swing write something fa fun wacky and crazy while building the skills and fundamentals why not you know this is a stage in your careers where you can do anything you have a lot of freedom right now um, and as a result you should be picking stuff that's just fun and that just reminds you why you wanted to do this in the first place um, so don't fall way too in love with your ideas for classes like this because just, you know, it's probably not going to be a movie. It's not going to be produced as a, as a feature film. We have to acknowledge that and move forward with that in the, you know, in the back of our minds that there's like 35 spec sales a year in Hollywood and they're almost all by very established writers. So we're just looking at this as practice. It's like running laps and building the muscles that you will need to get better at this. Okay, hopefully everyone's clear on that. So um, here's the steps. These are the same no matter what we're writing. Features, pilots, plays, books. Start with a logline, which is the one sentence expression of the idea that sort of answers the question, what is this about? That's followed by the sketchbook, which is a kind of unformatted collage of all your ideas, research, inspiration, pictures, links, documents, um, articles, videos, uh, and just ideas for characters, dialogue, scenes. You're going to try to be assembling the story by just throwing down everything that you have, everything you know, or everything you would like to perhaps include, even if you don't know how it's going to yet fit into the full picture of the thing. So the sketchbook should just be one single document. We don't want to have a bunch of different documents um, all over the place. So uh, make that, you can actually make that now. Let's make them now. So go to Google Docs. Let's do this. Um, do I have a slide on this? Here it is. Open Google Docs and make a brand new document. You're going to call it title of the movie sketchbook. If you don't have a title, you can call it Untitled Vampire Comedy Sketchbook or whatever you want. Um, at the top of this document, you just should include these basic categories, and you're going to fill these in as soon as you can, and maybe throughout class today, maybe by next week. You have title, genre, logline, and comps. Logline is that one-sentence expression that, of the premise. Comps are comparable titles that are going to sort of help us assess what the goals are for your project in terms of tone and content. So you're going to say, you know, if this is like... Uh, if this movie meets that movie, you might think of it as like the world of the first thing, but with the style, tone, or approach of the second thing. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that's just how I've thought of it in the past before and have had some success thinking of it that way. So you might think, you know, like Lord of the Rings meets True Detective equals a detective story set in a fantasy world. Does that make sense? So like the first thing might be just the setting or the arena that we're in. The next one is how we're going to approach that. But don't, if that doesn't work for you, then don't worry way too much about it. But if your prompts are going to help us assess if you only have comedy comps and your logline doesn't sound funny, then we're going to be like, you're not meeting your goals there. It seems like something's off. So comps are important and try to narrow it down to two, but you can include others in like a sort of short list of runner up comps. You can include, you can say it's like, I don't know, die hard meets uh, trading spaces, but it's going to, is trading spaces or trading places? One's a TLC show. One was the movie with Eddie Murphy. I can't remember which one's which, but in any case, um, that'd be kind of fun to be like an, uh, a cop, uh, trades lives with a criminal. I guess it's it's like uh, Prince and the Popper, but the cop and a criminal that looks similar. That'd be cool, actually. <laughs> um, anyway, someone do that. Someone do Die Hard meets Trading Places. But regardless, you see that. Um, try to just pick those two. You can include other comps in your shortlist that are like, also co might consider this has elements of blank and blank and blank. So you can just have like some suggestions for comps. Um, anyway, so yeah, make your sketchbook and try to fill these things out. We have a question in the chats about um, table reads. Those are Sundays at 2, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nacho. Right. 
Correct. Correct. And, uh, Go ahead. This week, so one of the things about Twitch Prime is um, you can also post giveaways of your complete intro for TV title. So um, everyone is welcome to submit you know, up to five pages and do giveaways of you know, short uh, excerpts from a lot of scripts. And once you've been participating for a while and giving feedback and uh, parts and stuff, you earn these little script coins, and then you can use them to, uh, like, quote uh, a reading of your complete script. In this case, we're doing a feature script by one of our members, Terry, um, and it's a cool animated feature. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks, Nacho. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we have our scripto currency, as I now prefer to call it, which is, like... A dumb little device to get people interacting on the server, giving feedback. You earn your scripto coins or whatever, and then eventually you, you can, if you get a hundred of them, you spend them on a table read. You get a bunch of people together; they all read your script and give you feedback. So, plenty of stuff to do on Script Camp besides just attending classes. Though you should definitely sign up scriptcamp.net/slash/membership and get your free trial to get unlimited access to everything here. You can still attend table reads, you can still attend workshops and events, even if you're not a subscriber, but um, you will not be able to attend things like Lab on Saturdays from 4 to 6, where you can bring anything you're working on for feedback, and you can also ask any questions or topics you want to hear about. Also, any course or any class past just the opening weeks of the boot camp, you must be a subscriber. All right, hopefully we all understand the basics of that. Let's get into log lines. Should I stop for questions first? Does anyone have any questions so far? Feel free to either unmute or to... Oh, here's a question from Taylor. Go ahead. Hey, um, so I know you had mentioned, um, you know, kind of choosing something that you're not going to have to, you know, do a ton of research on. Mm -hmm. um, but I, for this, I kind of wanted to experiment with a genre that I don't write much, which is sci-fi. Um, do you recommend um, doing a genre you're not, you know, too experienced with? Are you a big fan of it? Um, yeah, I like sci-fi. I could definitely watch more. I mean, um, I've seen all the classics, um, but it's something that I've been wanting to write for quite a while um, that I have kind of uh, plotted out in my head. Um, so I think it would be okay, but I'm just kind of wondering um, what's your take on doing a genre that you haven't written much of? I would say de definitely. Yeah, you for sure should. It's a great place to experiment and try something like that. that. That's why my only question is, are you a fan? The only time I would say to not write it is if you're like, no, I don't really like sci-fi, but I was thinking yeah. of writing one. <laughs> but that would be ridiculous, okay. right? That would be silly to, I think, at least, to write a genre you have, you're not, you're not into. So, but if you're into it, yeah, absolutely. Try a genre that you've always wanted to try. That's a great idea. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure. We have a question from... Red Dead Titan. Howdy. Hi. Uh, hey, it's Tom. Uh, lost my old account. I'm back. Hey, anyway, this is a little off topic. Wait, is my audio out posing right? Give me a sec. You sound right. fine to me. Sorry. Go ahead. Anyways, I'm um, a little off topic, but I was wondering how long would table reads usually last? Because I have work from 4 to 7 p.m. EST. Oh, um, they go for, I think, two to three hours most of the time. Um, they okay. table reads tend to go longer than you think they will. So um, I think if and if you're working four to seven EST, I think they start at five. So my thought is that you'd be working while they're going on. But maybe you're asking maybe after work you want to see if they're still going on. Yes, yes. That is okay, there, there's a chance they might still be going on, but they'll be towards the end. All right, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Tom has also asked in the chat, what's my favorite color? It's green. You can always count on script campers to ask the hard hitting questions. Everybody knows Luke is at his coolest when he in Return of the Jedi when he gets the green lightsaber. That's when he levels up to being badass, right? Also, when I was a kid, I always had the green lightsaber, and my brother had the red one, I think. <laughs> when we had the toy ones? When you were a kid, what? I guess that, that tells us a lot about you. It's almost like your Harry Potter house, isn't it? 
Not sure. What color was your toy lightsaber? What color was my what? Did you have a toy lightsaber when you were a kid? Did you like Star Wars oh, as a kid? I thought you said a Twilight saber. Oh, that sounds cool. Wait, no. Is that a <laughs> combination mesh, mashup of? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, no. I was always like the kid uh, in the window, you know, watching the other family. They were all the little kids had toy sabers. You weren't allowed to go outside and play with them. No, I was outside in the snow. Oh. The family, you know, the other family. We didn't, we weren't allowed to play with it. Dang, okay. So you were sort of the, you were the Anakin Skywalker of that situation. I, you I, were the... I had my first job at 10 years old. Right? Really? We're yeah. learning a lot today. Yeah. Well, dang, I've got to ask you more about that later. Okay, where are we? Um, my brain is uh, turning into goop. Let's, um, it looks like we have no more questions at the moment, so let's... Uh, Oh, Taylor had the Darth Maul as a kid. That means you're going to grow up to be a Sith Lord, I think. Um, okay, let's. Uh, it seems like we have no more questions, so let's go into log lines. So it's your story. Central conflict is still down to a sentence. It should essentially tell us who's this about, what are they trying to do, what's standing in the way. One sentence. You can do it in one sentence, uh, unless your script is astronomically complicated, at which point chances are it might be too complicated. If it's so complicated that it takes two sentences, it, you may ha your premise might just be too, either too vast for a movie, or it could be that you just... Chances are it's not that. Chances are it's that you just need to express it better, or you, you're including things that don't matter too much. Okay, so um, let's look at uh, some examples. Why bother with a logline? Well, because you need it, all right? Just trust me. Okay, so let's go to uh, the template for the logline. When or after inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes or ticking clock. That's kind of our bread and butter as what a logline should look like. There's some variation on this, and not all of the loglines are written by the writers. You can't just go to IMDb and look up what the logline was for the spec version of that script, if that script even began as a spec at all. So don't expect to always be able to find perfect versions of these online or to look at IMDb and say, oh, that must be the logline for this movie. No, those are just sometimes written by people in the marketing of that movie, marketing sort of, you know, department of that movie. If some are written by, if you see it on a list, such as Blacklist or Hitlist, it might be written by that writer's agent or manager. Um, some of my scripts that have gone out and been set up in town, I have not even been the final writer of the logline. So, and I'm not really, I don't even love some of the loglines that have gone out. In any case, we just are trying to use it for two things. One, to keep yourself on course for your story. Make sure you're not deviating or drifting too far from your original intention. And we're also sort of using it as a litmus test for, is this going to be a good script in the first place? I mean, a well-written logline is, chances are, written by a better writer than a poorly written logline. So we have to, you know, you're more likely to have it read and have people care if it is well-constructed. Okay, um, let's... Uh, answer any question let me see if there's anything else i wanted to say about loglines before we share them um this is just kind of a breakdown of some of those elements that i just mentioned and how you might think start thinking of structure in your outline you don't have to like think way too hard about this right now but um a good logline will give you a head start on outlining because it has that kind of really the really kind of formula almost formulaic nature of how it is laid out gives you some of the major plot points right here when or after inciting incident so that's the catalyst it's going to be like pages 10 to 15 in modern spec writing a lot of the time. An adjective protagonist, well, that's what we're setting up in the intro section. So if your character is going on some kind of journey or change, then we need to know how they start that journey to understand where they will end up. So that's why when, if we were talking about A Christmas Carol, we would say a grumpy old miser named Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Um, when he's visited by three ghosts, he must, you know, traverse through his life and kind of, I, I, I wonder what ex how exactly we would phrase what he needs to do in terms of a tangible objective. But you, you, you can tell that, obviously, the conventions have changed over time for storytelling. Modern high-concept screenplays operate best when there is a foundation of a logline to work from, which is sort of the simplest expression of that story. Um, and it's going to focus, really, on tangible goals and concrete finish lines so we can understand this character is trying to accomplish this external thing and you are sort of implying the internal journey you don't need to spell out the internal journey for us if we say it's about i don't know a rich miser who ends up when he loses everything he has to get a job at mcdonald's maybe that's the movie and and so he has to work his way back up to being the ceo of mcdonald's well okay we would want to sort of start the logline with the inciting incident so when he gets fired 
or when he when his company when his when there's a hostile takeover of his company a miserly uh, or grumpy we you know we only have one or two adjectives to use so be careful a a uh a miserly ceo must the must is going to help us understand what your character the urgency of your character's situation so it's helpful to use this word must or struggles to or something like that which will imply that this is a very important conflict for them it should feel like it has as high stakes and urgency as your genre sort of requires which most of them are going to require you know movies are typically about the most important events in someone's life so far that's not always true there are exceptions to that but a lot of the time we have to it has to feel like an important journey so must or struggles to is a good sort of phrase to lean on and then you would say what they need to accomplish he must make five hundred thousand dollars by the end of the year in order to get his job back whatever it is that his your character's goal is and it should feel tangible and like we can watch someone do that thing so it shouldn't be something like uh, your character must understand something or must come to terms with something those are purely internal processes so we want to explain what the external tangible journey is that they're going on <coughs> excuse me and um we're implying that internal journey okay I think I am uh, going to just pause for any more questions or clarification on log lines. Then we're going to share what we have, and I'm going to give that early feedback before my brain runs out of brain juice. So, any last questions or clarification you guys want on log lines or how they work? Buddha. 314 is recommending I drink coffee. You know, I actually don't like coffee at all. I can't. I can't do it with coffee. No, Nothing bitter. I can't drink beer either. Okay, if there's no more questions or clarifications, we will post log lines in the chats. And I'm going to paste them into Drive just so we can all look at them, although I may not be um, marking them up too much today. All right, so go ahead and post them now. Thank you, Becky. And Tom, thank you. Um, and thank you, Buddha. Looks like we may have a question from Pixelated Pickaxe. Go ahead. So I was just curious uh, if what I posted works. I mean, I see everyone else has these boxes around their prompts. I wasn't sure how they do that. I'm actually not sure either. Don't worry, you don't you don't have to do that. Um, let's just start with yours okay. then. Let me, let me bring it up. Okay, so is there a title and genre with this? Uh, yeah, I s started one. Um, Still oh. working on the, the overall... T it's the temporary title, so yeah. Okay, what's the temporary title? At the moment, I called it Jungle Jailbreaks because it takes place in a city of... in a jungle. Okay, Jungle Jailbreaks. And what's the genre? It's post-apocalyptic. Um, so... so like, horror or sci-fi? Or... So maybe you like, think... Uh, Go ahead. Horror, preferred. Horror. Okay, got it. Go ahead and read the logline for us. After waking up in a zombie apocalypse, a scared spiritual medium struggles to defend herself and adapt to changes in the, to the world around her before she can attempt to save the world using her own hidden talents. All right, thanks for sharing this. So, um, a couple things. Um, to begin with, anyone would be scared in a zombie apocalypse so the fact that you're saying she's scared doesn't really tell us much about the character does that make sense so we want to pick an element of their personality or like something that they're struggling with or some unique limitation or or something like that so try to maybe just change it. you pick a different adjective when you you don't have to solve this now but just that's just a suggestion for describing the character the other thing is, so you say she wakes up in a zombie apocalypse. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean she was like in like a, com she, in a coma? Find, so like I, I was thinking something along the lines of like she woke up from a, a deep sleep. So like she's recovering in the hospital and then she wakes up randomly and then the world just is a change drastically. 
Okay, you can do that. I will just say that's how both 28 Days Later and The Walking Dead both start. So this is like a really, really familiar opening for this kind of story. Oh, so, really? Okay. Yeah. So it's two of the most famous zombie stories both start that way. So you, you it's not to say you can't do it. I haven't it. seen either of those, so... Okay, that also it. would be a two of the most... I would I would watch a little more of the genre just to get a, um, a okay. really clear understanding. Um, so Go ahead. What I, was thinking, what I was thinking originally was, like, she wakes up as in, like... She's, like, in her bed. So, like, not in the hospital bed, but, like, you know... In her personal, like, chamber sort of deal. So what you really mean is when zombies attack is the inciting incident. The character waking up yeah. isn't the inciting incident. Okay. So when yeah. when a zombie virus decimates America would maybe be a better opening okay. li line for you. Yeah. Something like that. That's the actual event that starts the story. Um, so uh, We don't want to imply false causation where it's, it's not like her waking up is what causes it to happen. And it's also not really relevant. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Got it. Okay. So, other things. She struggles to defend herself and adapt to the changes in the world around her are all things that everyone would do and we would definitely assume your character was doing without even having to tell us that. So, I would think more along, uh, along the lines of getting right to her specific and tangible goal. What does she have to actually do in order to, you're saying, save the world using her talents? So, how is she going to go about that? I was honestly uh, envisioning a... Um... So her hidden talents involve like, like, cleansing those who, who are like struggling, and like finding their souls. So like I was thinking like something along the lines of she's able to fend off the zombies using those abilities. Okay, so but she still should have a clear, tangible objective in the story. And in zombie stories, there's different ways you can do this. Sometimes it's based around mm -hmm. finding an antidote or cure. Well, like what I was thinking with the objective, anyways, was something along the lines of, um, so, like, she's looking for other survivors who mm -hmm. she can, who can uh, keep her in check, I guess. Who can keep her in check. I'm not quite sure what that would mean um, in this context. So I would just well, maybe, like, go ahead. How would I explain it? Basically, she wants like survivors that she can get along with and can protect her in a sense. Okay, so same as everybody wants. We all we all want a group to help to be, a community or a group to be part of. Okay, but is that her? That's really the final goal. I thought it was about saving the world. Yeah, and then she she discovers she can save the world later. Of course. Okay. She meets the other people. Um. So it sounds like meeting this other group of people may not be relevant as relevant for the logline. Just focus on the character's mm -hmm. goal, and, unless it's like she meets somebody and by working with them she can save the world, or something like that. If there's some sort of central. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh, that is what like you're thinking. She... Okay. So she meets this group of people, and then they are able to help her use her abilities to put an end to what's going on. Okay, um, so I'm not I'm not sure what that would look like or or how that would work. So you may just need to do some thinking on the specificity of okay. your character's yeah, goal. Yeah, that makes sense. So it could it, do they have to find? This is where we want to get down to as as clear cut brass tacks as like do they have to find a magic crystal? Do they have to what pour some an antidote into the water supply? You see, we have to like just find what what specifically they have to do. Okay. Cool. Makes sense. So, so yeah, just get more concrete. Make make those really clear, tangible goalposts really apparent, and the logline should come together really well. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for sharing. Okay, um, we have a couple more loglines posted. Thank you, Judea, and Jay. Okay, I'm gonna try my best, guys. So um, I'm going to go in the order that they were posted. Okay, so our, um, who was the first one who shared after I asked? Was it Becky? All right, go ahead, Becky. Hello. Hi. Do you want to tell us about this one? Uh, yeah, so... Um, 
um, that well, I wrote with a friend that we want to turn into a very low budget um, feature. So uh, all B12 has ever known is life living with her mum, sheltered from the radiation outside. But she spots a man walk. Uh, but when that's meant to be when, when she spots a man walking around through the gap in her covered up windows she begins to doubt all she's been told but as she uncovers the truth her mum becomes more angry and paranoid b's biggest threat goes from the outside to the woman raising her in her home all right um, and i'm not Go like ahead. it's called sunshine one more time what was the title i help sunshine sunshine okay. um yeah the, the premise of the short was um what if the we we'd heard an article about what happened if there was like a massive um uh massive explosion of another sun nearby and it would cause like intense radiation so that's where our premise started but by the end of the time we'd written the short um the short ended with uh some of the people here have read it um ended with um the to question whether it really happened and at the end she walks out of the house um uh and we don't know whether you know her mum was lying to her her mum was lying to her or whether the outside was really um radiation and she died but in the film version we would be going on the premise that actually it's not her mum and she has been lying to her so she believes that there's radiation outside and they're living in this sheltered house and her mum is keeping up this ruse but actually it's because she's a kidnapped kid as a baby and mum's been keeping her hidden away and all the neighbours just think she's a weird um weird neighbour you know mm -hmm. um and the whole film would take place the exception of maybe you know the scene when she finally leaves uh the whole point is it's low budget minimal characters um i might introduce a third character just to have a bit more dynamics but yeah that would be the concept it's literally just like enclosed and easy to film okay so we're what... gonna film it okay so what is the genre um i thought psychological thriller it's that kind of, you know, the kids is sort of discovering and um, the more that it'd be very tension driven, you know, the more she learns about, the more um, aggressive and um, frightening her own mum becomes. Uh, so it sort of goes from her being afraid of the outside to actually her starting to become afraid of her own mum as her own mum starts to unravel uh, as B starts to learn the truth. Okay. Um, I think I can essentially see it, um, but this is, for a premise this simple, you definitely don't need this many sentences to e express it. Um, yeah, no, I know. Yeah. It's so, really long. So I'm trying to get through the fact that it's, to begin with, is almost a sci-fi setting, you know, with them hiding away, but it's actually not. Yeah. So that, to me, makes this, I mean, um, this is... The movie is just a girl in, the, in a house with her mom. It's I wouldn't if unless we're actually interacting with some sort of sci-fi element. I think psychological thriller is probably the best way to describe this because this I wouldn't really consider yeah. this a sci-fi movie if this is just a girl in a house with her mom. Um. So yeah, uh, no, no. It's, go ahead. As I say, it, the 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 only sci-fi element is the lie that she's been told as right. to why she's there. So the house is all like covered up with. And planks and um, tin foil, and you know, the mum has implied that they are protecting themselves from radiation, so it's dark and gloomy. And sure, I understand. But so let me ask: it's you're setting up. Is this you mentioned? She sees a guy walking around. Is this another character in the movie, or it, are you implying this person's important somehow, or no? Yes. Yeah, so in the short that we wrote, the thing that made us start to question: she, she sort of peeled back a bit of the tinfoil on the window so that she could peek outside and one time during one night she actually sees someone peering in and then there's a knock at the door where someone's asking if there's any children in the home and the mum pretend it's the army doing their rounds and they get food delivery and the mum says oh it's the army dropping off supplies so um there are people outside 
and the mum um, puts on a contamination suit every time she's or you know every time she's gonna go out but basically she's kind of dying to her all the time so um right. I, I understand but so let's go back to the question is this a character in the movie or not is this person important or, or no yes yeah, yeah he's the inciting incident her seeing him is what starts her questioning and he might be one that i might start to bring back a few times that, that i guess that's what i'm and maybe you, i guess you're saying you haven't decided then yet if this character is an important person in the movie no we, we well we're trying to turn the short into a feature we imagine that actually this character might need to come back a few times maybe it's a concerned neighbor or something that's trying to make contact with her um so probably will be yeah because it might be quite um, hard to write just with the two characters. <laughs> it will be, certainly. But especially when there's the mystery at play is so simple. It's sort of just like, has the world ended? The yes or no? And, and like, that's pretty yeah. easy to assess, I would say. In any case, though, um, so it's not like... The, I, I just mean if you have a, a contained mystery thriller, then, or, then, like, normally there needs to be a little bit more of a substantial mystery, unless... I mean, and I'm thinking in terms of movies like Sleuth from 1972, based on the Anthony Schaefer play. One of the best movies, in my opinion. It's two guys in a house talking, but there is actually kind of a complex mystery going on. There's, like, layers to unravel. There's, there's like, the... Well, I don't want to get too into it, but I, I hope... Um, I, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is that the, the logline, as you've written it, it seems to be giving a lot of importance. Like, the fact that you'd mentioned this other guy in the logline makes it sound like he's going to be sort of a, an important character in the movie. Whereas maybe you haven't made that tr- you haven't like determined that yet. You feel like he is. Okay. So I you f- might. I feel like he is. Okay. So you might need to just like reduce this to one sentence in such a way that we can tell what's important. Um, and mm. it, it's probably just get, like, cause I was thinking if that guy is, if, if that guy is only, only exists to be someone that she glimpses and that, then starts to suspect the world may be still there then your logline may not even need to mention that guy at all. It might just be something like when she suspects that the world may actually not be destroyed, a sheltered girl, you know, must break or must escape from her house or must, you know, outwit her mother to escape from her house, something like that. Or, or like it just, it's a very, very simple premise that we don't need all this explanation and setup. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm struggling, I think, because I don't fully know the story yet myself, but Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I th- one of the mysteries would also be, like, who is she? Because, um, I'm not, I, you know, I, I like the idea of us going back and forth of has the world really ended? Like, you know, you can do it in a way where, because um, it's all from her point of view, right? So it'd all be from, we'd be seeing what only what she can see. So maybe she gets some evidence that the world really has ended and then other evidence that, you know it hasn't and it's all contradictory um but also the question is like who is she and where did she come from because i don't think her mum's her mum <laughs> okay. do you know what i mean i like yeah. sure. so, so that that's um, interesting stuff you might need to just i guess bake the idea a little more to figure out what's important enough to include like what you're sort of um what what's going to make up the substance like the the middle of the story is it going to be you know, we have some other character that's in, is, is sort of like, I mean, it's like 10 Cloverfield Lane, essentially. But that has three, I think, three characters, right? And we can, therefore, by just having one other person, it's like a totally different dynamic, and, and it radically changes the entire thing. Um, but I would try to phrase it maybe... I, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I was thinking at, like, say, the midpoint of introducing another character that kind of goes along with the mum, and so we then start to believe it's real but then maybe that other character is being coerced or forced to for some reason i kind of thought that might make an interesting twist sure i could see that i think you might it might be worth mentioning in the log line um but in in, in any case i would just probably rephrase this something like um to you know like when she realizes the world hasn't actually been destroyed a sheltered girl must outwit her controlling mother to escape the house something like that would just be a really simple expression of what the story is Right. So you don't have to use exactly that, but hopefully that just is like it should be that if it's if it's that simple of a movie idea, it should be that simply expressed. I feel. Yeah. All right. Any questions I mean, on this? Yeah. Well, yeah, but she doesn't actually realize that the world is um, 
hasn't actually been destroyed, she she kind of suspects because that's pretty much the premise of the whole film is that she doesn't know the truth. And it's this big thing of if she leaves the house and her mum is telling the truth, she'll die. So mm -hmm. although I know the truth, that's like the result at the end where we find out that actually old hasn't ended. She does that the whole film, the whole concept of the film is that she doesn't actually know. Mm hmm well, in that case, you could write when she sus suspects that the world hasn't been destroyed. It's just that that doesn't really sound like an inciting incident, starting to suspect something. So I like, I mean, I see why in this case you have pointed out what the specific incident is that causes her to suspect that the world may not be destroyed. In any case, I just, just used realize there because it sounds more like a definite moment rather than a process. Does that make well, sense? I just feel like, yeah, I do, yeah. I just feel like putting realized kind of gives away the whole film in the log line. <laughs> as in, sure gives away the ending <laughs> right and the tension is on oh she doesn't know the truth i see okay so maybe just find a more definite incident um that you can quickly summarize rather than having to explain the every step of how she sees the guy through the window and stuff like that but if you can make it feel yeah. like an inciting incident rather than over time she slowly comes to suspect something then it will just be much clearer yeah perfect thank you sure thanks for sharing Yeah, 10 Cloverfield Lane, somebody mentioned in the chat. That was a good one. Um, also, I will just mention there's a Danny Boyle uh, sci-fi horror, th horror thriller called Sunshine that is one of my favorite movies um, and is quite well known. So you may need to think of a slightly different title, perhaps. Okay, um, let's move on to our next one. Sorry, my brain is still a little goofy, so at some point I may ask if, if Nacho is willing to step in and take over for me. Um, if he's not, that's okay, and we may just need to end a little early. Um, I will keep... Hey, Nacho. Sure, I'll just move back up here, I guess. Okay. Thanks, man. Um, so let's go on to uh, the next one for now. Uh, there's a chance I can power through it. I, might, I can just feel the... The juice escaping. <laughs> the juice escaping. It's the Brain worst thing juice. I've <laughs> put it back in the jaw. Okay, let's go to our next one down. Let's see who shared after Becky. Was it Tom or was it Jay? Maybe we need to do this in a separate channel. <laughs> I think that's usually the most useful way to do this. Um, okay, so I think it's Tom. So let's bring up Tom. Go on, Tom. Is this the one 30 years after... Oh, wait. Is this just a fan fiction of Quantum Leap? So I've invited you up. You'll have to click the Accept button at the green bar. Should look like... Uh, this? It worked. Okay. It worked. Great. Yep, yeah, we hear you fine. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's a fan fiction. Okay, it's a fan fiction, but it's in script form, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, so, and this is a movie, right? Sorry. Uh, it, it is a series. Oh, this is, so, and this is a further feature boot camp today, so we're doing feature ideas. Do you have a feature that you want to look at as well? Oh, it's a, oh, I'll put that I'm sorry. Oh, no big deal. We have um, TV class meets Fridays at 6, so you can come to the next one if you want. Thanks, Tom. All right, let's um, move on to our next one. I think J, the Omnifractal Prelude. Wow, what a title. So I've invited you to speak. There we are. Hi, Jay. Hi, hello. So why don't uh, you tell us, lot, about, uh, yeah. tell us about this one? Uh, I'm proud of myself because I used uh, big boy words. Uh, great. So great. That's good. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's sci fi, and the logline goes uh, when a team of astronauts is, uh, are unexpectedly pulled into a fractal dimension that contains the culmination of all existing information, they must navigate through the mysterious and dangerous world while facing their own emotional conflicts. As they uncover deeper secrets hidden within the fractal dimension, they realize that their journey has profound implications, not only for humanity, but 
for the very fabric of reality itself and life itself. But yeah. All right. Uh, Thanks for that. It's go ahead. Yeah. So it's uh, it's where these astronauts they uh, go to collect biological samples for another planet that they plan on, uh, you know, settling in, uh, colonizing, mm-hmm. but they unexpectedly get pulled into I wouldn't call it like a dimension but it's like a pocket reality where everything is just made of 3D fractals um well basically one day I just got stoned and I watched this like really trippy fractal like videos with like cool music and I was just imagining myself just going through it so it's like 3D version of that and uh since it's mathematical it's an infinite version of just infinite fractals and they're made of uh every information to ever exist and it's it's a complex universe and uh so the whole concept like the point to this is to focus on the implications uh, of discovery and what it could mean for everybody uh, if you can have every information that you want, if it, what happens if it falls into the wrong hands or the right hands? I mean, it, at that point, it wouldn't matter, you know, if uh, if you could make a world, if if you can make the world a better place when you have every information to everything that everything that you ever wanted. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond everything. So it's more psychological and philosoph- uh, philosophical. And it focuses on the character's uh, personal journeys through it and realizing and going through existential crises in that universe, in, in a physical form, not just in their head, you know, actually experiencing it. So that's what I have. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm really struggling to understand this one, and um, there's a, a lot of words here, but I don't understand what we're doing in the movie in the slightest. What is the character's goal? The character's goal, okay, okay, well, for the character's goal is to escape and go back home. Okay, to escape uh, and go back in home. In short, yes. Got yeah. it. And how do they do that? Uh, they don't. They, they, they don't. all die. They all die, okay. How do they attempt yeah. to do that? Is there something that they, do they have some kind of objective in mind? Uh, okay, so... Uh, I've been writing this script, but for the most part, I keep it, uh, uh, how do I say it, um, like a mystery that they wouldn't get out of the ship for the most part. It's more about some astronauts going outside and like not returning. It's something like the mist, you know? Right. But, uh, but you know, in a different setting. And the conflicts uh, that I focus on this movie is, uh, is like like they want to go back home but they can't go back home because if they leave they they take back something that might uh that might have implications that could change everything that they've ever known so that's like the main conflict that they go through i don't understand yeah. um and so i think so a couple things let's just go top down okay. um starting yeah. with the, right. the biggest things main character you need a main character mm-hmm. to sort of focus and hinge this journey on. All the movies that you listed all have really clear main characters. Who's the main character of Interstellar? It's Cooper. Who's the main character of Annihilation? It's Natalie Portman's character. Who's the main... You see what I mean? So, like, we... Although those yeah. movies have other characters that are important, too, focus on the main one. And that character's emotional journey and what objective are they trying to accomplish. There's a lot of this that we just assume that you included. For instance, they must navigate... What, like they're facing their own emotional conflicts. We we assume that every character is facing emotional conflicts in a movie. You mm-hmm. don't need to. You only have a limited amount of words to use in a logline. It's not a hard limit, but we should try to avoid li- including redundant information or things that we otherwise would know. Um, so try to rephrase this in terms of when inciting incident. So I'm with you so far. When a team of astronauts is sucked into an alternate dimension or a, a weird geometric dimension or whatever it is, a blank an adjective mm-hmm. protagonist must specific tangible goal before blank before they get trapped there forever i think is what or is what you're maybe saying or maybe before is there some sort of threat are there monsters in this dimension like is there some kind of antagonist it seems like maybe no uh there are there are 
Yeah. Is yeah. there an, who's the antagonist? Uh, the antagonist is the dimension itself. It is not actively trying to kill them, but it, it's it's uh, it's it's trippy. Like the way like if you get directly exposed to the environment, your brain just crumbles with the weight of all information. So you just, you, you basically just die, like in okay. a hostile environment. So they'll just die if they stay there too long. That's the urgency yeah. of yeah. this. Okay. So before the dimension kills them, maybe would be your um, yes. like or last part of your logline. But anyway, one single sentence. When inciting incident, an adjective protagonist mm-hmm. must conflict before stakes. So it might be like, they must find the wormhole. They must reach the pyramid. You know, like find the specific thing that they have okay. to do. Even if they fail, okay. it doesn't matter if they fail. But we mm-hmm. at least want to know what we're watching people attempt to do and what some of those challenges might look like. We don't care about the, the philosophical implications of the story as much. That's got to be subtext. You've got to just, like, have that in the script. And then the logline tells us the brass tacks. What are we watching a person try to do? So whose story is this is our major question. And then the adjective that you use to describe them is going to sort of tell us what is their emotional motivation or how are they changing? You know, like, what is Cooper trying to do in Interstellar? Well, he's a father that's trying to fix his relationship with his daughter, right? So we have that as the center point of the story, and we understand by accomplishing this external objective, he will be able to get back to his daughter and that's so we understand the motivation right mm-hmm. so yeah fo- uh, it's ahead. similar to that yeah it's similar to uh, that. okay so the main uh, the, the protagonist um he breaks up with his ex-girlfriend who's the the head of the organization that sent them to space because she sabotaged uh, sabotaged his missions like his previous missions so he wouldn't get in wow so he finally gets in and he goes on the mission but then on the mission itself he finds out why she didn't want him to go then he wants to return back to her to fix their relationship i don't know if it's too much like interstellar no it's not that much like interstellar it's about a guy trying to get back to his ex that he broke up with what how is that that's the (laughs) go ahead uh yeah i mean he broke up with her because Uh she uh well she couldn't reveal that uh, she sabotaged his missions uh, because she's the boss of him, basically. I don't think you're supposed to date your boss normally. Like, do you see how even on its surface, it's sort of like a weird setup that you... He was dating, like, the head of NASA, basically, and then she was... No, no, no. Go ahead. I mean, well, it, in this future, uh, space travel is uh, not so... Uh, like, it's it's uncommon, but it's still common enough that they have regular space, mis- uh, space missions. And regular so workplace have, uh, relationships? I mean, like, you're not supposed to date your boss. I mean, like, it, this is a big HR concern. I mean, hey, there's no HR, okay? Not in this universe. Uh, okay, maybe you could... I mean, yeah, maybe if it's, like, a future Star Trek kind of utopia where it's, like, we don't use money, love is free in the future, like, all that kind of... Maybe that is the world that you're painting. Yeah. But it's just a weird... Mo- like, everyone understands a father trying to get back to his daughter, right? Yeah. I'm trying to get back to my ex that I broke up with because I thought she was sabotaging me, but then I later learned why she was sabotaging me is a bizarre motivation for your main character. It's like, maybe it makes sense in the story. But in the logline, we try mm-hmm. to want to kind of highlight what yeah, is the... the problem. Okay, yeah, Yeah, because I couldn't put it in the logline that, you know, he's trying to get back to someone he's broken up with. You know, well, that, that to me indicates there's a story problem that your motivation for your character is just weird to begin with. Like, if, if you feel like you can't include it in the logline because it would spoil the logline in some way, then it could be that that element is just mistuned. And it seems like maybe you're already writing mm-hmm. the script, so I don't. I haven't read the script. Maybe this all makes perfect sense, so don't take this as, like, the final word on this. Yeah. But just based, just based, and may, maybe it's how you're conveying it, or maybe it's just, like, questions, or maybe my brain is goop right now, so it's not the best, like, I'm just not processing super well. But it, if, it should be so simple that it can be expressed in one sentence. When, a, when the world is mm-hmm. threatened, of, and of, 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 you know, uh, the, uh, a father leaves to go find a new planet for... The, his, for Earth, for people to live on, I'm doing a terrible job of pitching Interstellar. But in or, and then once he succeeds in that, he will be able to return to his kid, who, by the way, is getting older every time. Like that's the main sort of cost of that journey is that he's going to miss their whole lives, um, and that's just really easy to understand and root for and relate to. So it may be that you need to kind of just go back to the basics of what is motivating your character, uh, especially if it's like that's sort of the emotional center piece of the whole movie that mm. everything revolves around. Um, and so it, it may be that you just need to sort of assess that a little bit. But regardless, trim this down to one single sentence. When inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must specific tangible conflict or else stakes. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. I hope that helps. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you. Um, Jay was great at taking all this feedback, by the way. I know it is difficult sometimes to hear elements of your idea don't work, but this is like essential to build these skills of um, in court, taking in, like, even if you think everything that I'm saying is stupid and wrong, at least put a nice face on it and be like, okay, well, thanks. I'll see how I can incorporate that. And then like, cause you're not going to like every note you get. Um, and sometimes the people giving you notes, you will not have, they, they're not writers. Like a lot of the time they're not writers. So you have to sort of decode what they mean. In this case, I am a writer, so I feel at least I hope that I'm able to give incisive commentary. But regardless, just try to practice the skill of receiving notes and rolling with the punches. And you, you don't have to take any of those. They're not like instructions for you to do. It's not like you have to then go and revise it. You can do whatever you want afterwards. This is all just sort of advice to help you. So great job, Jay. OK, um, let's move to our next one. It looks like. Judea? Or wait, no, hang on, I, I skipped you, someone before, didn't I? Who did I skip before? Yeah, I think you said you were gonna do Brian. You're right. Next. Brian, you ready now? Brian D, is that right? Hey Brian, your mic's on mute, just so you know. There's that button, there it is, that's never sales to fails to amuse. Um, <laughs> okay. So, hi, thank you. I, I went straight down the middle, uh, take, trying to take your advice, you know, do something simple. Um, and I just put in a new uh, version there. Great. So, okay. Uh, there we go. Can you read it out for us? Sure. <clears throat> so just, just a log line, correct? Mm hmm So uh, when a notorious mobster brings an advanced race car prototype into the city, a conflicted street racer must join a heist to get a chance to drive it before the cops drag her and her friends to jail. All right, thanks for that. And it's called Festiva? Festiva. Festiva. Yeah. yeah, that's actually a play on an old Ford car uh, called the Ford Festiva, and the character's name is Forbes Festiva. So it, it's, you know, I'll bring that up during the script, obviously. <laughs> okay. So um, your comps are Altered Carbon meets Baby Driver, Action, Comedy, and Cyberpunk. So I would just pick two genres, try not to do three. Yeah. Um, so pick what the most relevant things are. Um, the comps sound cool. I want to make sure they seem, they sound like they're describing this. When a notorious mobster brings an advanced race car prototype into the city, a conflicted street racer must join a heist to get a chance to drive it before the cops drag her and her friends to jail. I feel like we I'm going down a staircase and I skipped a couple steps. Why okay. is why so what is the racer conflicted about? Yeah, I, I understand that. That's actually a great question. So the idea behind the character, and I'm not able to get into the log line yet, is that um, she's had some trouble in school. She's like early 20s. She's had trouble in school, and she's trying to get her life straight. And all of a sudden, this you know, magnificent opportunity comes up. And she wants to go and, uh, it, like, her primary intent is to drive fast. Like, that's all she really cares about. Again, very simple premise. Um, and she sees this car come into town. It's like, I need to get my hands on that. And the only way I can get into it is to sort of team up with it in this heist, which, of course, will drive her deeper into trouble, give her more family problems, um, you know, and generally ruin her life if she goes. Why does she need to drive the car? Just, she just, you're saying she just wants to? Yes. This so is she... like a. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, this is why I put in, this is why I'm, I'm experimenting with the comedy idea. It's just like an overwhelming urge for her. This is what she likes to do. I think Baby Driver is the comp in that in that uh, sense. It's like, he likes to do what he does, but he's being forced to do something that he loves um, by, uh, you know, this leverage that, that Kevin Spacey's character has over him. Wait, so, wait, yeah. yeah Baby, Dr similar, Baby Driver loves to drive. He doesn't love to commit yeah. crime, though. So, right, yes. yes. But in this case, you're well, saying... She wants to she so badly that she's car. willing to ruin her life, essentially, to get a chance yeah. to drive this cool car. Yes. And that's your main character? Yeah, bad person. <laughs> I guess it's just more just like a bizarre motivation to, to begin with, but maybe... You, I would you not can... disagree, yeah. Okay, so yeah. let me just look at the rest of this. There might be a way to, to make it work. Um, so... Yeah. A conflicted street racer must join a heist. Well, she does... She, it's not... The word must here is sort of being used it, usually it implies that they actually have to do that but in this case it would just be a conflicted street racer joins a heist to get a chance to drive it 
just drive? Does she want the car? She wants the car herself. She knows she can't own it, so she wants this opportunity to get behind the wheel just once. Wait, what? Is, what <clears> she, <throat> so she's willing to commit crime and, and ruin her life, but just to drive the car, not even to steal the car or to have it? I don't get it. Those are, those are really great questions. So I think we, what I'd have to do is frame it almost in sort of an addiction, if I'm going to continue with it, right? Like I would mm-hmm. have to frame it almost in an, an addiction form where people will do stupid things to get a hit of that, uh, you know, that excitement of driving the car. So I'd probably have to play that up. This is a pretty new idea to me. I'm just, uh, that's, so yeah, I, I'm that's, not sure I have all the answers yet. It's totally fine. Yeah, it's just like, my questions are mostly just like these basic, basic things. Like right. if the... If the character has, to, if the character is being compelled to do this or something like that, then I, it would just make more sense to me if you say she's trying to steal the car rather than she just wants to drive it a single time. I, I don't, I, I'm like, yeah, it's like a complex motivation within a complex motivation, and, and <laughs> it, it, um, I think you just need to find the, the simplicity here. Uh, right. So, <clears throat> she must join a heist. Thinking to... I was being so simple. No, this, yeah. So that's the that's the thing is that uh, it. It, the action might be simple, but the reasons why it's happening aren't. Um, Got it. Because this is, again, a really difficult thing to understand and relate to. I mean, I don't think very many people have ever... Like, we can we can get wanting a cool car, but I don't. I can't imagine ruining my life for just a chance to drive it one single time. Um, I, if you're already willing to go that far, why not keep it? Um, so that's kind of just my thought there. Good point. Let's never steal it. Thank you. So, yeah, maybe... And, and I mean, if you really want to do the sort of storyline of she is essentially a villain protagonist who is doing this for self entirely selfish reasons and does not have any reason she needs to do this like at least most crime stories are like they have a family they need to provide for or something like there's some actual reason why they need to commit this high stakes crime in your case if your character doesn't succeed nothing happens she can back out at any time there's no stakes i mean the only stakes are ones that she's creating for herself by getting involved in this crime that she didn't even need to get involved in so it may be that this isn't the protagonist, maybe? You, like, you may need to find somebody else. That, when it, maybe think of it something like, when her best friend, a, a, it, or when she learns, that, or she discovers that her best friend is a serial car thief, um, a blank you know, main character has to stop her friend, or she gets dragged into the heist, or something like that. So our main character, maybe, is somebody that this thief has dragged into this, and, and our main character is trying to stop them or get out of it or avoid you know the consequences racking up or avoid going to jail you know something like that i could really understand and relate to if, if this was more like the villain of the movie than the main character or if we had somebody to sort of root for or be on their side does this make sense you don't have to do this but that's yeah, just no like... it totally makes sense yeah, yeah. In, in that case yeah. the mobster yeah. might be the hero i don't know um <laughs> but it's mentioning that character here makes it sound like that's going to be a really relevant person so if it's just like when a new car hits the market or when it is being shown in town, something like that, you don't need to mention that other character if they aren't going to play a big role. So you're sort of making that promise that that character is going to be really relevant in the story. Okay. So yeah, the in, the, in terms of basic motivations in this one, I would maybe, excuse me, try to find a different main character or, um, yeah, like think of, uh, is there like a central relationship that we can really lean on here um, that will we can be like sort of rooting for that person to get out of the consequences of this because their friend is getting them into trouble and it's more like that kind of story that might work or maybe it's like um you just need to find some better reason why she's doing the heist but if you don't do either of those things it's difficult to invest in this journey um because this just feels like somebody wants to play real life gta and if they don't that nothing bad happens they're just getting into trouble for no reason (laughs) it just feels like we're watching a crazy person right and i live in los angeles so we have plenty of that we do have plenty of that that's true all i have to do is walk out to my street (laughs) absolutely (laughs) <laughs> okay, um, so I hope that helps. Any questions on this one? It does, yeah. I'm sorry, what was your question? Do you have any more questions that I can answer on this? No, no, I mean, I, I this was a very early idea to try to play it right down the middle, and I'm understanding that's more complex than that. So I, I appreciate that a lot. That, that's quite elucidating. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, the, a cyberpunk car heist is a cool idea. Um, so that the, the basics of that, like a car, car heist movie set in a cyberpunk world, is a great core of this. Um, but... Uh, maybe think of how that can be more central to your premise in some way might be helpful as well like is your main character like a hacker and a hacker like in the future a hacker could steal a car right nowadays it'd be tough for a hacker to steal a car but in a cyberpunk think of something that can only happen in a cyberpunk world maybe and see if you can link that a little i mean the fact that it is a prototype super fast car is cool um but primarily this is you're just gonna it's just gonna be a faster than normal car right unless it can do stuff can it do cool stuff 
Uh, not in my imagination, no. I mean, it has, it, the idea was it was uh, like a cyberpunk, a cyberpunk implant, so you sort of bond with the car in this way. And oh, that's really cool. Direct I... neural interfaces. And, and, you know, hopefully we would have an opportunity to show that she can do it better than anybody else who's tried it, and, you know, the car sort of really is her car. You know, these are all tropes, obviously, but uh, I was trying to experiment with them. You know? I think, yeah, no, I think that all sounds cool, and that would be worth incorporating into the logline if that's going to be a big element of the story. Yeah. Okay, hope that helps. I, I know it's an, it's an earlier yeah, idea, so obviously early ideas will still get a lot of feed, get more feedback than more developed ideas. Um, but uh, the bones are here. I like the basics of it, so I think you if you just make a couple tweaks to the motivation and the goal of the character, and maybe find that a little bit different focus of the character, then um, you'll have something for sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for sharing. Okay, um, I think Judea was up next. She's still here? Yep. So coming up today, we'll look at um, the Cinder's contract. Uh, sorry, I couldn't click the accept, so I just did mod things. It's all good. Can you read this out for us? Or tell us about this? Yes, I will. Let me just scroll up quite a bit. I also posted it into the um, video if you just click the video feed. Oh, oops. Uh, well, I already scrolled up. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, after she's humiliated during a royal ball, a vindictive peasant girl must make a contract with a jaded demon to win the heart of the prince and escape her family before her meek stepsister gets to him. All right. So, Thank you for sharing yeah. this. So um, let me just make sure that I understand the basics. So it's called the Cinder's Contract. It's a rom-com. Is this is like a fantasy rom-com, I guess, is what you're saying, right? Uh, what? Sorry. Isn't, there's demons. Yeah, this is a fantasy rom-com. movie. Okay, so fantasy. Okay. Um, comps are Cinderella and Mean Girls, maybe? Okay. After she's humiliated during a royal ball, a vindictive peasant girl. Why is a peasant at a royal ball? Um, it's sort of like, because it's like Cinderella, it's like that whole, you know, prince is available bachelor, gotta invite all the girls. <laughs> they don't invite the peasants, though, do they? Why would they? I don't know. I thought they did. No, definitely not. So, royalty only wants to marry other royalty. If you marry a peasant, that's called a lowborn marriage, and that's usually really frowned upon. So, I think they need to, you'd need to clarify okay. why, why. If that's like a, a plot element, then you might need to clarify that. In any case, you could just say she's a servant at the ball or something, right? I mean, if it's Cinderella, she's literally the cleaning girl, isn't she? Oh, she's not Cinderella. I was going to make this about the stepsister, one of the stepsisters. About a stepsister? Oh, oh, but... Uh, yeah. But, okay. One... So, but but in any case, I just have that question right off the bat of, well, why would a peasant be at a royal ball? So if there's some reason that yeah. we need uh, to... If I there's guess some I rule... just thought they were peasants initially but i'll just change it to like something else Ch change which element so the part that she's a peasant the part that she's at the ball the, which yeah part, which part peasant part okay so she's a royal mm -hmm. yes okay so after she's humiliated during a royal ball a princess or something a you know a countess something must make a contract with a gentlemanly demon to win the heart of the prince and escape her family before her meek stepsister gets to him first. How are these events connected? How is the, the, why is this the inciting incident? Why is being humiliated at the ball the reason that she must now win his heart? Uh, because like, I'm, I'm going to make it play out like, you know, Cinderella, where uh, well, Cinderella, you know, gets to the prince and well, the, stepsisters sort of humiliate themselves while at the ball. Uh, but but so I'm asking, so how does why is the ball the inciting incident of the her getting humiliated is the inciting incident that sets the whole movie in motion somehow? Yeah, because like that's where they meet the prince in the first place. Oh, so is meeting the prince the inciting incident? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then being humiliated is not even a relevant element for the logline. I think it's when she meets a prince. She meets the man of her dreams and maybe falls in love with him, something like that? Mm. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay, so when, yeah. She, when she 
meets this prince and falls in love, she must make a contract with a demon to win his heart and escape her family before her meek stepsister gets to him first, gets to the prince, not the demon, I'm assuming you mean, right? Um, so why yeah. does she have to make this contract? What's standing in the way? Uh, I guess mostly, like, herself and her family. She feels like uh, she can't really get to him through, like, normal means. Why would her family not want her to marry a prince? Um, it's sort of like, it's just all this competition in the way, I guess. Uh, her sisters and her mother being, like, terrible and all this stuff. Oh, it's the competition. So she feels like she will not... She feels like he'll choose someone else over her? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I think this story sounds a little more like when she meets the man of her dreams, but it turns out there's a long line of suitors in the way, a vindictive princess or something needs to make a contract to sort of... Are you saying we're going to, like, mind control him to love her? Or what do you mean exactly by no, win, win his heart? just, oh, okay. like, sort of... Uh, it'll be, like... You know, try to make her more desirable in a way, uh, but not, like, mind control him. Oh, she needs a demon just to give her, like, uh, a, make a makeover? Like, oh, you know how the fairy godmother works? Like mm -hmm. that. I just wanted to make it, like, a demon contest. Right, but the but Cinderella is a peasant girl that gets turned into... Or she, she gives the impression of being royalty through the magic. She gets a fancy dress. She gets, like, the carriage. Right, so she, they are, like peasants because like how did her step family get there then um i don't remember so this and there's going to be differences between the fairy tale versus are you talking about the disney version which is different than the original like hans christian yeah. Anderson fairy tale so i'm not sure the specifics of, of cinderella but just in terms of your story i think that we just need to like if 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 we need to to contact a demon to do this it feels like the demon would have to do something magic and important like in, in Cinderella's case, make her essentially, uh, you give her a glow up makeover, fancy, turn you into a princess kind of thing. Um, I can see how yeah, in... yeah, I guess I would like her to be like what? Go ahead, I'm, I'm listening. I guess I would like her to be like something of like you know, low born status. Okay, and th so in that case the, that what's standing in the way of her being with him is the fact that she's not a princess. So that is what you'd need to frame sort of the conflict around you know she i guess then the question would be is she is she doing this to win the heart of the prince or like i, I guess just the order of information is mixed up a little bit for me now but regardless maybe yeah just make some some of those choices about your character's background and what exactly this contract is doing um you know like uh i hope that this has been helpful so far i just was like missing some of those 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 basics um does that answer your, does that help with, with with this or do you have more questions on this? Um I think it helps. You think uh, oh, sorry, you think no? Your mic may have cut out for one second. I, I think it helps. Uh I, I guess I'm I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, well, if you um, if you work on it a little bit and bring it to the next one or to the next lab, then I'm glad to give you feedback on the revision. All right. All right, thanks so much for sharing. Um, do we have more? Are there more in the list? There's got, I think there was one more, wasn't there? Uh, Taylor, it looks like. Did I do yours already? No. Let's do Taylor's. This is why we have to do a separate channel for these, because otherwise, the in the order they're posted, it's just so hard to keep track of. Hi, Taylor. <coughs> hey, how's it going? Going good. What have we got for us today? Um, let me pull it up and post it further. I'll, I'll paste it in the video feed. There you go. Oh, cool. Got it. So, why don't you start us off by reading this one? Yeah, um, so I don't have a title for it yet. It is a sci-fi feature um, that I would compare to Lord of War, um, the Nicolas Cage movie um, meets Independence Day with the logline of, as extraterrestrials systematically decimate the planet, a scrappy arms dealer must obtain futuristic weapons within seven days to defend his impoverished native country. 
All right, thanks for this. Um, Lord of War meets Independence Day sounds cool. As extraterrestrials systematically decimate the planet, is the planet Earth? Yes. It is, okay. A scrappy arms dealer must obtain futuristic weapons within seven days to defend his impoverished native... What's his native country? Um, so right now, it, it would definitely just be made up. I'm trying to think of a name. Um, but it would be comparable to like a South Pacific Island country. Um, like somewhere between like Hawaii and Australia. Um, I would say comparable to like Fiji, Samoa. Okay, so he's trying to de defend his sort of like home homeland. Is that, that's the idea? Yeah. Okay, and why? Um, hang on. Uh, a scrappy arms dealer must obtain futuristic weapons within seven days. So he's going to be able to obtain and operate weapons that can fend off all of the entire armada of alien forces? So that I definitely haven't gotten to that part of the thought process yet. <clears throat> um, right now, still kind of in the outlining process. Um, it's a... Where I'm at is that this is um, him working alongside the government um, to be able to broker deals. Um, it's a really small country um, with pretty minimal military um, and he gets arrested for by Interpol for doing um, an illegal arms deal. Um, this is like right before um, this invasion occurs. He's deported and jailed in his home country. Um, when the invasion happens, the government comes to him about how to broker arms deals and he starts working alongside them to be able to do this. Um, and in the process um, starts realizing that just normal bullets aren't going to cut it and they're going to have to start um, looking for more futuristic weapons that will be able to um, uh, handle this situation and the we're so if you get big enough ray guns for the army of your little army island nation you, we're going to be able to fend off a force of aliens that's big enough to exterminate the entire earth yeah so right now um, I haven't really ironed that all out um, okay. Basically, where I'm at is that I know what I want to do is an arms dealer has to um, figure out a way to broker deals um, to get um, military power to be able to fight aliens. It wouldn't necessarily be just guns. Um, it could be vehicles. Um, I'm tr really trying to stay away from Independence Day um, stuff. Um, but it may go into that direction of um, being able to obtain um, just alien weaponry. Okay. It feels sort of like... I mean, I know you said you may just have to do some more thinking on the basics of this premise, because just in terms of like motivation and urgency, his quest feels kind of pointless. I mean, the fact that... Um, I mean, in this version of the logline, the idea of a weapons dealer tr trying to protect humanity through arms deals in f in a futuristic sort of sci-fi setting is a cool idea. So don't take this as me saying the basis of this idea is dumb. It's definitely not. But the, um, the, the, the fact would be that unless you phrase it in such a way that he's trying to get like a bomb that can destroy the alien mothership or something like that, or, or like, I don't know, a, a force field that can surround his entire island indefinitely... And then it just feels like if your aliens are so powerful that they're exterminating everyone else in the entire world, you know, the might of every military combined, then your character would have to get something that could actually hold them off or actually turn the tide. And the sort of things that an arms dealer would be able to procure, I'm just struggling to understand what that is or who he's procur procuring them from or what exactly the challenge is. What is the conflict? Like, what is standing in the way here? Is there an antagonist or what is, like, um, do you see what I'm saying? Like, I think we just yeah. need... Go ahead. Yeah, so antagonists um i would wouldn't say that as of now i have a um you know direct antagonist and it would be more um the time frame and then the impending threat of this um and then like i know it'd be boring but like like bureaucratic red tape of doing these deals and having to like um convince the government like this is how it's going to have to be done. Um, so I guess like that is kind of where I'm at with an antagonist, um, but nothing super concrete at the moment.
so it might work a little better if it's just sort of saying if you t turn down the power of the aliens a little bit and we say like the world is currently at war with them some people are winning some aren't okay and because of that this island nation if it got enough ray guns and shit it actually could hold out and survive but do you see how if the aliens are exterminating the earth i don't believe that an arms dealer would be able to get something that would be able to save just his nation indefinitely forever his quest feels like it doesn't it's not actually important they're gonna die anyway so do you see how maybe you could like just shape the world a little bit differently so that it feels like he could actually do this yeah um absolutely i hadn't really thought of that um i had kind of gotten stuck in this like thought of you know this war hasn't occurred at the start it does um but maybe moving into um it being an ongoing war that we're dropped into mm -hmm. um would be able to kind of fix out some of those holes that might kind of work yeah it starts with the war already going on that's like the normal state of the world that could be cool we haven't really seen much of that so that would be neat i'm just throwing that out there um but yeah we just need to feel like his quest could actually reasonably succeed otherwise it feels like why even bother doing this and when he's, it doesn't feel like he's trying to beat the aliens or win. If his goal is just protect his home country, then it needs to feel like that's achievable within the scope of his abilities. Um, unless you want to change it, so he's trying to give us the thing that will kill the aliens. Like if there's if they have some weakness or something, and he needs and like I love this idea. Think of does he need to maybe go to the galactic market and get the one thing that can kill the aliens, so that it's like a special kind of bullet that can pierce their armor or something like you know it's some poison that will kill them, something like that. Maybe we can release it into the atmosphere to make it hostile to them or something along those lines. But in that case, your character would be doing intergalactic arms dealing, which I think is personally a great way to take it. You don't have to use that, but I think it would be way cooler. Maybe not way cooler. Maybe I mean, of course, you can reshape what you have to make it make a lot of sense and, and like really work. But just where my mind goes is, oh, what if we had to get the thing to beat the aliens from other aliens? That could be cool. Or maybe it's like the Covenant where there could be like different species that are all underneath this faction and we can like maybe deal with some of them maybe think like maybe district nine where there there are some of them the war's been going on for a while so some of them just live on earth by now and maybe some of them might have the secrets that we need does this make sense am i giving you some ideas yeah. here or steering you way of course no definitely i'm actually typing these all down in the sketchbook right now okay um, yeah great ideas and has me thinking in a better direction than i was an hour ago cool 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 hope that helps i know it's sort of me saying the basics of this are not exactly clicking into place but just the conflict is cool and the idea of an arms dealer being someone who is trying to help save humanity or at least his home in a, especially in the sci-fi context is cool so there's there's really cool stuff here i hope i it just like a few tweaks to the motivation and the objective will really help this one awesome thank you so much i appreciate it sure sure thanks so much for sharing okay um do we have more Feel free to weigh in now. Oh, I think, um, did Joya have one for us? Joya, did you post a logline and that you'd like to get feedback on? I'll invite you to speak if you'd like. Yes, yes I did. All right. And I put it, um, <laughs> I learned my lesson with last night. Um, so, but I put it in a Google Docs Mm -hmm. um it what whatever happens to it i don't care um so because i had um crossed out some things that were in the log line to see which one works better so i have okay. the document somewhere yeah so much. it's it seems like the you ha you'll need to turn on the sharing settings if you want me to open the document but you can also just copy and paste the log line into our chat so if you just highlight it and do Control c or edit copy and then click on our oh, I had anyone with the link can view um, then I'm, I'm looking at it now. It says I need access. I don't have access. Oh, okay. Just kidding. Um, let's see. Must have. Oh, okay. Yeah, I changed it back. Okay. There it is. I'll try again. All right. There it is. Okay. So why don't you read this out for us? Okay. Uh, the title is Blood and Bone. It's a genre. Um, it's a drama. Pomps, John Q, The Heart of Christmas, which I just learned about, <laughs> like, in the last half hour, which is some TV movie, uh, The Big Sick. So the log line is, and okay, the log line is, when her dying child needs a, 
might just leave that part out, transplant, a timid mother must reconnect with her estranged family before her child dies. So I crossed out bone marrow and to find a donor match. Um, Why? I didn't know if that makes it more, um, I didn't know if it made it better or more succinct or what, but. No, no, I would uh, def so definitely don't, don't, don't cross either of these things out. This is all important information. So keep, keep this uh, bone marrow transplant, important to know. We need to know what she's doing in the movie to try to find a donor match that clarifies why she has to connect with her family. Um, so, yeah, leave all that. No, the logline looks really good. Um, is this is this another idea for the logline, or is this what is this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another idea for the logline. A timid mother um, finds herself forced to face her estranged. So, a lot of words we don't finds herself forced to face her. Well, you mean she must face her estranged parents? Like we just have too many words their family expectations and her self-worth this is all internal character stuff the first log line is way better because gotcha. okay. this is the external journey that we understand that the the internal journey of the relationships will be we, we will kind of infer that from what you have here or that's like the subtext of the external journey so yeah use this first one keep this stuff that you've crossed out and it, it's in really good shape yay okay is there oh, okay, one member question. of the family? Sorry, or, I, I have one. Just one more question for you, and then I'll, I'll take take yours, of course. Um, so, if there's one member of the family, I think the mother, sort of, in what I've seen of yours so far, has seemed like the kind of center point of this. So, if there's a way that you can, especially in a drama, mention that other character as opposed to just her estranged family, maybe um, she goes to visit her estranged family and must reconnect with her mother or something like that. In, in your case, I think she's willing to take a donation from anyone in the family, so that may not work. But just keep that. See if there's a way that it could work. Um, we just, if we want to know who that central relationship is with, because that's also the antagonist of the movie. Um, and right now, it just feels like it could be centered around anyone in the family. Whereas I think that if there's like a center point for the conflict, then you'll want to mention that. Okay. What was your question? Um. Well, when I was looking at the second log line, I was thinking about the things that you'd said um, before you said them. And I was like, well, maybe I should just stop the sentence at estranged parents, then period. Uh, Must reconnect with her estranged parents. That's how the log line would end. Um, no, I think yeah, it's uh, important to know to find a donor match. Ace, so, uh, go ahead. Um, oh, the second one finds herself forced to face her estranged parents, then just period. Okay, and then my questions would be why? Uh, to, to do what? Like, she is forced to ah, face gotcha. them. Why is she forced, you know? So I think the first one's much better just because it tells us exactly specifically what she's trying to do. Gotcha. Okay. All right, any questions on this one? Cool. Thanks Good. for sharing. We'll get Mother Angle, and thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Um, looks like we have an update from Judea. If nobody, if there's no new ones to do, I can look at updates because we have a little time. Samar has one. Okay, go ahead, Samar. So, if there's anyone that I've missed, let me know now. Michelle, do you have a question or do you have a log line? You can come up on the stage if you'd like. Uh, I think she may have accidentally left the room. No, she's there. So I've invited you. You'll have to click the accept button. Looks like this. So you're not muted. You're in the audience. We're in a stage channel right now. So you'll need to click the accept invitation to speak button that looks like this green bar. If you're on a tablet or something, you may need to turn it to the side to find it. The button won't click. Okay, maybe try leaving the room and rejoining, or you can restart Discord, see if that works. I'm gonna do someone else's in the meantime as Michelle's fixing this issue. Um, so did anyone else have a brand new logline for us that I've not gotten to yet? Some more feel free to show yours in the chat. Oh, there it is. All right, um, 
I will invite you to speak. So title and genre would be useful to include as well. So um, you can tell us that if you want. Go ahead. I've invited you up. Michelle seems like she's having some trouble clicking the button, so you can just write it in the chat. Sure, yeah, you can just write your comment or question in the chat if you'd like. Samara, are you able to see the accept button? Okay, I've invited both of you guys up to speak. If any, if either of you click the accept, then I can ask, answer questions or look at your log lines. If not, I'll move back to looking at revisions if people want. All right, so we're going to move to Judea's revision, um, and uh, until and if somebody else, if one of you guys is able to accept the invitation and come up on the stage and speak, you're free to do that. But uh, let's look at the new Cinders contract. Contract of Cinders. Romance, comedy, drama. It seems like romance and fantasy or fantasy rom com is. You need oh, to have fantasy yeah. in here somewhere. I was about to change that. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, let's look at the new lock line. Can you read this for us? Yes. It didn't change much, but let me just change this to fantasy romance real quick. Okay. Let's see. Romeo. Okay. After she meets the prince at a once in a lifetime royal ball, well, I guess it would just be a ball at this point. <laughs> um, a vindictive peasant girl must make a contract with a jaded demon to disguise her as a royal so she can win the prince's heart and escape her family before her meek stepsister gets to him first. All right, so much better. Um, so. She meets the prince. She must make it. So is he like the guy of her dreams? Are they actually in love, or what's going on there? For her, it's probably a one-sided love. She's like, this is my ticket out of here, and also like, he's handsome. That's a plus kind of deal. Oh, oh, okay. So you mean to say, this is just for selfish reasons? This isn't for the purposes of. Um, yeah, she doesn't she's very love selfish. Him. I want her to be like very selfish, um, and all okay. that. Okay, so her motivation is different from what most people would assume. So I would point that out in the logline. I would I would say you know as her ticket out of poverty, of in, you know vindictive vindictive peasant girl, all these things that you said before. So maybe try to clarify that that's why she's doing that in the logline because that's important. Um, she must make a contract with a jaded demon to disguise her as a royal. Sure, okay, I can see how you, in a Cinderella kind of way this would require a demon to do, so that she can win the prince's heart, and escape her family before her meek stepsister gets to him first. If her stepsister is described as meek, why is she the first, his first choice? Um, I guess, like, as it goes in, like, uh, I guess I want it to be, like, he falls in love with her genuinely, the meek step stepsister. Like, he, they, he falls like, in love with the, 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 family the, the... He falls in love with the antagonist, essentially, you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. So she's now trying to this is like an anti fairy tale then, where so there's sort of like they're in love for real, and she's trying to steal him away so that she can just get out of her situation. Is that right? Mm hmm. Okay, so that's cool. I would just kind of mention that, like something like you know, tell us that they're actually in love. So that's that's what a big part of the conflict is. Um, it's not that there's a ton uh, of. Should I like change the first part? Like after she meets her ticket out of poverty at a once in a lifetime ball something like that i mean you mm. yeah you i'm not exactly sure how to rephrase it specifically but you might need to just incorporate all of these things we're talking about maybe just like um uh yes of course start with the inciting incident when, when i mean but wait is did she not know there was a prince before or something why is so is um she's never met the prince but at this fall she's like finally met him like they know there's a prince it's right. just that like how is she gonna get to him you know so the problem is, so he, she meets him at first, and he is not interested in her at all because she's a peasant, right? No, not because she's a peasant, but mostly because of like her personality and her nastiness, kind of. Deal. 
Oh, well then, then the demon's contract um, won't help her to fix her problem in that case because it, you're phrasing it in such a way. That's like that... why I want like the demon to help her with that by like you know basically trying to change her. But you said but... he's changing her into a royal, which is framing that as the main problem. When you're yeah, saying that... but like when you're like a royal, there's all these like manners lessons and all this stuff going on. I guess that's what I wanted. That's true, but in that case, I would just clarify that that's the crux of the problem. The problem wasn't that she wasn't a royal, it was that she was, like, rude, I guess you're saying? He, the prince didn't care about her rank or her station, which is very unusual for a prince, by the way, to not care about the rank or station of who they're marrying. It's, a, a marriage is a political move um, in this time frame, where they're made for alliances and uh, for... Go ahead. It's not necessarily for marriage now. It's like I took Nacho's suggestion to make it like a peasants can go to this ball too kind of deal. So it's just like, you know, a ball for everyone. Mm -hmm. but, so he's not really looking for a marriage partner at this moment. But then the ball doesn't but, feel like the inciting incident of the story even. Like, unless the, like, and especially if we're saying peasants can go to the ball and have just as much opportunity to marry royals as anyone else, then her transforming into a royal doesn't feel like it will solve her problem. Um, because that was never what was standing in the way. Okay. So maybe just some other, like, maybe maybe world... Like, you can you can definitely do that. You can do that thing where you're like, in this kingdom, things work this way. You can totally make stuff up, especially, I like how you, you said, it's the one city in your ball that anyone can go to. Something like that does make sense, I do understand. But it, it, it feels like there should still be a barrier between a peasant marrying a royal, right? That's just how the world works, or, or normally it is. And it's it's an exception when, like that's why there are fairy tales about like the the prince actually falls in love with this girl and does everything for her because that was like noteworthy to do or like to marry for love was considered like uh, unusual and like that's a um, that's why there's stories about it. In, in any case, um, and I like how you're if you sort of you're sort of angling this as the anti fairy tale. It's like the Cinderella ish story, but from the point of view of someone who's sort of bad, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe if you say, and, and, and I like the way that, that that is sort of inverted by the fact that there is that true, like, he actually has fallen in love with her sister, and our main character is trying to steal him away just for selfish reasons. There is something interesting there with that. That is, like, an inversion of how fairy tales work. So I think that is fascinating. Um, just maybe look at just some of those basic elements of, like, how this, um, like, what she wants and what's standing in the way. And then the magic pact she's making should directly address that problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Any questions on this? Uh, I guess like I don't know how to word this. Yeah, that's so. That's a, a lot of the time. That's the challenge of writing is spending the time to figure out how to word it. Um, so I'm glad to look at your revision whenever it's ready. But um, the uh, I think that's the the extent of my brain soup feedback at the moment. All right, thank you. Sure, thanks for sharing. It does sound cool, so I would stick with this one. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tadeo. All right, um, Samar, did you, were you able to accept the invitation to speak? I've just invited you again. If not, we'll move to, it looks like Michelle has a new logline for us. Joya asks, I'm muted, right? I'm working hard to stay quiet. Yes, you're, we're in a stage channel, so we can't hear anyone except the ones that I bring on the stage. Michelle says she's trying to reconnect to her computer so she can accept the invitation. Okay. I've invited Samar to speak as well, if he's able. Uh, I think you sent it to me. Someone, <laughs> someone invited me. Oh, did I? On accident, maybe. He says it doesn't work. I'm not sure why that would be. Seems a few people are having trouble with that today. Maybe there actually is something wrong with maybe Discord is goofing um, up right now. Yeah, sometimes if you're on the phone, it like it covers up like the top of your phone covers up the you know the um, little button. But you may need to just um, I don't know. Hmm. Try turning it sideways. Keep that up. Or try a different device if you have a, another computer, a phone, tablet, laptop, anything.
Okay, so we have about 15 minutes. Hopefully they're able to get on stage and speak. But um, let me just ask, is there anyone else that I missed or that did not uh, get their logline read? Anyone have any questions on anything we talked about today on the upcoming feature writing program or just on screenwriting in general? It looks like we got Samar made it and Becky and, Rick and Carmen have some questions. Okay. Um, we'll start with uh, Samar then. Hi, Samar. Your mic is muted, just so you know. You'll have to click the small gray microphone icon in the bottom left corner of the Discord window to find to unmute yourself. So, so you're I hear Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Um, we're trying to hear from Samar. If he's not able to unmute in a second, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, can you hear me now? Hi. Yes, we hear you. We're just we're waiting on someone else to answer, but I think that I'm. Oh, go ahead. Well, I can, we can we can go to them, and since now I can accept on the, my computer, I can do it. After yeah. The no. Let's let's actually. It seems like he's having a little trouble. We can start with yours. Sure. Try try again, Samar. You were you were just you were server muted, but now you're not. Try, oh, okay. Try hit the hit the microphone button, Samar. Do you see a little microphone? Samar can go ahead and go. Yeah, Samar. Do you see the little thing that looks like a microphone? Uh, this thing. I see it flickering on and off. There we go. There we go. You can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, finally. All right. So are you ready to share your logline? Yeah, sure. OK, um, so. I'll um, send it here. I'm um, um, talking about the script. It's talking about a mentally disordered boy and girl at high school. They suffer from a lot of rumors from their friends and classmates that they love each other. Some people say that they are already in love and they are cheating on each other. And while they didn't even talk, just like uh, their eyes when they look at each other, they interpret these looks according to many perspectives. Um, and some scenes or some events happen like um, uh, the main thing is that they are suffering from mental disabilities um, and uh, uh, they got into the psychiatric hospital several times and um, uh, they at the end uh, meet again, they meet again and uh, it's like something crazy, I can't understand what, what's the main point that I should focus when I'm writing the log line. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really what I'm saying. It's the story at all. Yeah, I can say it. Okay, so just let, want... let me let yeah, me just sure, read it sure. read it back and make sure that I understand the basics. So, two mentally disordered boy and girl in high school are skeptical about their love feelings for each other. They later are diagnosed with love delusion. I'm not sure what that is, and suffer to find the truth. I'm not sure what that means. Um, so love. I think I'm just struggling to understand what you're saying a little bit here. Um. There, this is a is and is there a title and genre? This is a is this a romance movie? Uh, psychological drama and romance. Uh, the love delusion is a psychological uh, term that refers to uh, when someone thinks that someone is in love with him while it's not true. Oh. And, uh, while in this story, the truth is that they already love each other, but their psychiatrist diagnoses them with having. Uh, delusional disorders about their love ideas their psychiatrist tells them that they actually just think they're in love and that they aren't really uh, the psychiatrist tell them tells them that uh, it's fake and it's not true why because they never 
They never talk to each other even once. They never talk to each other? How? What? I'm kind of lost. Okay. It's something uh, so vague, okay? <laughs> okay, um, I think uh, I need to explain more, uh, but the story is just full of a lot of, uh, a lot of scenes and a lot of ideas. So, so next time. Uh, yeah. So so maybe maybe tr tr try try writing the logline with the format that we talked about here. So we want to know what is the event that starts the story. That's the inciting incident. So it goes like this: when or after inciting incident. So when something happens, when the when a boy when and focus on a main character. So is it the boy or the girl? I guess we would ask. Um, so when she meets a this character, when she meets this guy, or when she falls in love with this guy, or when they start dating, whatever the event is that starts the story an adjective mm -hmm. protagonist so you're gonna say a you know uh, a nerdy girl whatever it is like however we describe the person must mm -hmm. conflict like they have a goal a character should have a really clear goal um before or else stakes that's the thing that's like um you know what's gonna happen if we don't succeed um why is this important and impactful so i think you should just try to focus on a really tangible character goal um so is it like Figure, figure out what the problem is. What is the conflict? Um, and then express it in, in, in terms similar to this that will tell us, like, whose story is this? What's standing in the way? And how are they attempting to overcome it? Okay, thank you. Sure, I hope that helps. All right, so I think we had a, a, a few more. Michelle, um, do you want to read your log line? Your mic is um, back to mute, just so you know. Michelle, are you still here? Oh, sorry, I was pressing the wrong thing. Ah, okay, um, let me get to where I wrote it, because I hadn't written it down until um, in this class. Um, That's okay, I've got it right here if you just want to look at the Oh, okay, screen. yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, you go ahead and read it because it's because it's a little far away for me to read. Okay, um, I can also just zoom in a little bit if you. Need. But when a meteorologist in 1900 Galveston, Texas, mismanages the hurricane report of a Category Four hurricane, an unsuspecting doctor, his family, and neighbors must try to survive it as the storm threatens to kill them. All right, thanks for this. It's so, based, go ahead. It's, it's based upon a real story. That's what it's a. His, I should put historical drama. Um, sure. Because it, uh, as, um, it's based upon a real event that happened in Galveston, which is just 50 miles away from, from Houston, and it's on the coast, obviously. And um, this is 1900, and you know there's, there, you know there's um, no protections like we have, you know, like they didn't have a seawall. There's a big like 20 foot seawall now in Galveston because of this. And um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so you know there's tons of houses destroyed, thousands of people lost their lives. And um, Galveston, Texas at that time was the place to live. I mean, there were a lot of very wealthy people there. Um, the Astors had a, um, had a um, house there. Um, so, you know, um, and this guy, Isaac, I forgot his last name, but it's, um, but this, this story concept is based upon the book Isaac Storm, but I didn't want to use that because, you know, that's the name of that book, but it's, it is also referred to as the storm of the century, and um, okay. it was a Cat Four um, hurricane, and um, and we had a Cat Four hurricane here in Houston a few years called called Harvey, mm -hmm. and um, so think of Harvey in the 1900s, you know that literally wipes out like 80 percent of this island, you know, coastal community. Okay. And, um, anyway, so I've got so, some questions. Um, so yeah, ba yeah. Bas basic questions. What has this guy mismanaging a hurricane report? What has that got to do with the events of the story? Okay, if he had what not, does that even mean? Um, okay, he mismanages the report. He actually tells people that it's it's going to be fine. You don't need to worry. Um, you know, you don't need to leave your homes. You're, if, you know, this is not going to be that bad. And you know, they were used to flooding from smaller hurricanes frequently, like cat one or two um so you know they're thinking oh okay we, we can survive this and he lies to people 
So I really instead I instead of mismanaging, I should say he just I don't I didn't know how to say, you know, he lies about so I could just say he lies about the hurricane report. You know, when people ask him, well, they can tell a storm is coming, but he lies about it. He tells them that, oh, no, everything's fine, you know, and, um, well, nothing of the same, nothing of that, of, of the like. And so, you know, because he lies about this, people die, you know, the building, it, but, you know. The, okay, so is this guy a character in the movie, or is this just the something that happens in the events yes, of this? Yes, a character in the movie. I mean, I'm not yes. good at writing plot lines, so, okay. so he... So Isaac, I mean, I, since it's historical, I would, you know, I would say his name because it's said in the book and the man is dead now. So it's OK to call him out. Um, but um, I the reason I, I want to do this in the future is because it's just a fascinating story to me, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody here, they everybody knows. Oh, yeah, the big hurricane in Galveston, mm -hmm, you know, um, so um, but. Yes, he would be a character, but like I said, I just didn't know how to write him as the character yet. Well, it sounds like, I mean, I guess I'm asking, not just does he appear in the movie, but is he important in the movie beyond just, like, it sounds like the majority of this is going to be about a family in their house trying to survive a storm. Is that right? Well, what I kind of wanted it to be was about also him as a as the bad guy. You know, at first he seems like a, like a good guy. He's a well-trained meteorologist. He goes to Galveston. He's, you know, he seems like he does a really great job at predicting the weather, but for, you know, his ego gets involved, and this time he, he lies about how badly the storm is, you know, or he, about how bad the storm is going to be, and um, so I want that to be part of it, and then you said that, you know, if you have like a, at first I was going to write about, you know, the town trying to survive, but you've said, you know, even in an ensemble, there's always like one person, you know, um, that's the focus of things. So I thought, well, mm -hmm. in reality, there was a doctor and people kept showing up at his house, you know, begging to, you know, to live in his well-constructed home. So I thought, okay, he'll be, you know, that one, he'll be that focus. So, you know, I don't know exactly what to do to, to make the, the meteorologist, you know, the focus and this doctor and his family and the neighbors. Because I'm trying to show about how this town is being destroyed, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, I focus on like, you know, a group of people instead of like the entire town. Right. I mean, obviously, yeah, that town has hundreds or thousands of people we have to choose just our main characters carefully right um right. so so i think that um just the scope and the focus of this um just feels like you need to make some choices on who's actually the most important character here i mean if this is mostly about a if this is like sort of almost like a contained thriller about a family in their house trying to survive a storm then yeah of course you're going to want to put this doctor at the center of it if this meteorologist is actually going to continue to play a role in the story, then we're going to want to sort of know how he's factoring in. I mean, is he with the family? Maybe something like that could make it more relevant? Like they're um, sheltering in the same place? Could you do that? No, actually, um, he in the real life, they did not shelter in place. But um, the doctor did know um, the, the meteorologist. He kind of was a town celebrity. Um, and um, then... Um, you know, um, afterwards, he basically, the, the meteorologist has to leave town because he's, he's, you know, basically run out of town. Oh, and, the story um, continues after the storm is over? Well, yes, you know, I mean, there are people who do survive. Not every, you know, not every single person is killed, you know, on the, you know, on the island. So, you know, I thought, well, if I could write a scene where the doctor, you know, goes up and punches the, you know, the meteorologist for lying you know about this you know i mean i don't know but, but you know i'm but they knew a hurricane how... was coming right yeah not a cat four though he lied okay. he lied about how he lied about i mean here in houston texas we get here hurricanes almost every year and mm -hmm. harvey was a was a cat four okay but and he it, also it, lives it, in that town right Yes, but you need under you need to understand in 1900 a cat four hurricane they would have fled to houston okay, okay. So it sounds and like he made a mistake. Yes. It doesn't really sound like he maliciously lied. If he it, and it just feels like a weird thing to center the story on. That doesn't feel that urgent or relevant. Like I think the most watching a, people try to survive. Go ahead. 
in reality, he did lie. He knew it was a cat foot. Meteor meteorology at the at that time was good enough for him to know the severity of the storm, and okay. so he knew that it was a cat four, and he lied about the severity of it. Why? I think because I, I'm not too sure why. I think it was because people. Uh, my understanding from um, I haven't read the book. I watched the watched the video about it, and I'm going to read the book in the future. Um, I think the reason was that you know he felt um, he felt as if if he told people the truth, they would lose confidence in him, which is stupid because you know if he knew it was a cat four, okay, and he was afraid that people would lose confidence in him. You know, and lying if he was only right. Wait, what? Right. I know it makes no sense. That's the whole point. Is it? It doesn't make any sense why this man would lie. Now, if it's re, if the movie is rewritten that he's mistaken, okay, he's not a bad character. He's just mistaken. Yeah. You know. The, so then why did okay. we even mention it in the logline? It doesn't even feel relevant for the story. Well, but uh, what I'm saying is that in in. I want to try and make it as factual as possible, you know? So, you know, he, I'm not too sure why he lies, you know? And I, nobody seems to really know 100% why he lied about this, you know? But is it so, that interesting of an answer? Is there that a very interesting answer? It sounds just like a mistake. I mean, I, I don't get why that's such an important focus of the story. This is about a family trying to survive a storm. Forget about the guy lying. About, the meteorologist was wrong about how severe it would be, or downplayed how bad it would be. Maybe okay, uh, that just doesn't feel that important to, to me. Uh, I don't. I don't know why we'd make that the focus of a survival drama about a family trying to live through a storm. Do you see what I mean? Well, okay. It. I say it's relative because see, they didn't leave because right. they didn't realize how bad it would be. So right. without that, you don't have the drama. But had he not, you know, had he not misrepresented or lied about it, yes, yeah, you wouldn't have any drama. But had he told people, then they would have, like I said, they would have fled to Houston, you know, because right. Houston was pretty built up by then. You know, it had like 200,000 people already, you know, and um, so it, it, they would have, you know, fl fled to there. So, you know, there wouldn't be a whole lot of drama, you know, but the fact that he misrepresented slash lied about this you do have drama but at the same time i'm thinking that there's going to be anger from the townsfolk you know because they could have you know been in a much better place than you know if if they knew what was going on you know if he had just simply said this is a horrible storm you need to leave now you know but the, but the importance of the action in your story is not who do we blame for this i thought that this was mostly i thought the oh. main action of this was taking place during the storm, like trying to survive the storm. Isn't that the focus oh. of the story? Duh. Okay. I haven't finished installing the coffee app. <laughs> okay. So, so okay. I, my, my, I, rec I, my recommendation I, for you is just leave out the stuff with the meteorologist. It doesn't sound relevant for okay. the log line, even if that is part of the, if that is part of the real history or that's part of what comes up in the script as to why they didn't evacuate or something like that. You can include that, but for the log line, focus on the thing that is most pressing, relevant, urgent, interesting, which is okay. when a, Hurricane threatens his home, a blank protagonist, adjective protagonist, right. must conflict before or else stakes. Make sense? Okay, so, yeah, okay, so the, so the meteorologist is going to play a very, is going to play a minor part in this, and that, okay, in this case, he would be mistaken for the purpose of, of the script. That he doesn't. Well, know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't work. matter. It's just it's not the thing that causes the story to happen. The hurricane is what is the inciting incident. It it's like this is just a minor detail as to why the people weren't as prepared for it as they could have been. They still knew there would be a hurricane. So like the that's the inciting incident when a hurricane threatens okay. his and hometown. They, and they chose to stay, you know. Right, but that's because they yeah no I don't so I think your inciting incident is when a hurricane threatens his hometown. An adjective doctor must conflict before stakes. Try to phrase it in those lines, and I think you'll be in good shape. Okay, okay. I, I really appreciate it. And um, this isn't going to get written for probably a year. Oh, wow. Because okay. I've, got, I've, I've got to read the book. I've got to do more research about it. Because I, I want it to be as historically accurate as possible. Sure, sure. I understand. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for sharing. All right, we're at the end of our time for today. Um, next week is going to be same time, same place, same channel for week one. That is also a free class, so you can come with your revised logline if you got some feedback on it today. 
my brain will be working better <laughs> next week, we hope. Um, and uh, we have other stuff coming up today. Nacho, do you want to tell people what we have coming up just uh, today? There's Table Reads in an Hour. There's Magic Fantasy. Magic Fantasy. The uh, Magic Mini Workshop at 5. Is there anything else? And thank you guys. Thank you, Taylor and Jay, for sharing and taking feedback so well. Are you there, Nacho? Oh, maybe not. That's okay. All right, I'll leave it on the list of upcoming classes for you guys, and I'm going to share this presentation with everyone who came out, so you can review these slides later. There's a bunch more I didn't get to, so there's lots more info on blog lines, stakes, motivation, urgency, all these really relevant things for your story. All right, thanks so much for coming, guys. I'll see you later today at 5 Pacific time if you'd like to hear a little bit about magic. That's in four hours. Um, table read in one hour, so plenty of things going on, and things coming up. I'll leave it on here for a minute, but um, I will close this one out. Thanks so much, folks. We hope to see you soon. Remember to sign up, scriptcamp.net slash membership for your two-week free trial of everything we do. Thanks, guys.